Attention American poker players, do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to GlobalPoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for U.S. players. That's GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. Today's episode features Toronto's own Sorel Mitzi, who was at one point the number one ranked online player in the world. Uh, he's also been a great live tournament player, chopping the Irish Poker Open and grabbing wins in a few EPT prelims, the Borgata Spring Poker Open, the Festa Al Lago, the Win Classic and some high roller titles at the Grand Prix de Paris, WPT Vienna, and the Party Poker Premier League. Sorrell has also done very well at the Aussie Millions, finishing 16th in 2009, 3rd in 2010, 9th in 2011, and 2nd in 2014. As of right now, Sorrell has 11.9 million in live earnings, which is number 44 on the all-time money list, and number four on Canada's all-time list behind just Mike McDonald, Jonathan Duhamel, and of course, Daniel Negreanu. Now, a quick Google search will remind you that Sorrell is no stranger to controversy, and he doesn't shy away from addressing it here. But it's clear from his response that he feels that he was singled out because of his status in the poker world. And after some self-editing, as he puts it, those days of finding trouble are hopefully behind him. Anyway, Here's my conversation with Sorel Mitzi. So I'm here with Sorel Mizzi. Mitzi. Mitzi. Right. Sorrel Two Mitzi. Z's equal a T, right? You got a yeah. pizza. You put a little Italian emphasis on it. Right. Exactly. That's where your family's from, Italy? Uh, my, mo- my mom is Jewish and my dad's from Malta. Okay. So, yeah, the Malta, Maltese, uh, Mitzi's actually a really common last name in Malta, but Malta only has 300,000 people. So, yeah. It's not a very common last name. <laughs> There weren't a lot of Mitzis in your homeroom at school, though, right? No. Yeah. I've never met another Mitzi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about uh, the beginning. Let's go back to Toronto. Tell me about uh, the family. What were you getting into around that time? Well, yeah. So I was in Toronto up until the age of about 18. Mm-hmm. Didn't really see too much outside of Toronto. Mm-hmm. I went to Malta a couple times to see my grandparents. But other than that, maybe the U.S. once. I remember going to Vermont. But in Toronto itself. Well, that's interesting. Your dad was this guy who obviously was an immigrant. Yep. You know, and you didn't get to see the world yet. No, not at all. I mean, I came from pretty humble means, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I was raised by both parents, but um, I didn't grow up in like into any kind of money. Um, It was kind of like a lifestyle where. We were just getting by, but my parents had enough to where it didn't look like we were just getting by. Yeah. Like we seemed to be doing okay. Um, well, what did they do? My mom was in market research. Okay. So she sent people on surveys. Um, and my dad did various jobs throughout my childhood. Uh, he was like a driver once, um, not a taxi cab driver, but a uh, like a courtesy driver for an auto company. Okay. And... Um, for most of my life, he, he wasn't working because my dad's older. My dad's about 87 now. Wow. Yeah. And my, oh. so my mom was the, the main breadwinner. I kind of grew up in a situation where my dad w- had more feminine energy and my mom had more masculine energy, mm-hmm. at least from like a traditional sense. She was she was the breadwinner. He was the homemaker. Exactly. Like my dad cooked. He cleaned. He gardened. Is it just you and your brother, Marcus? No, my brother, Calvin, also. Okay. Like two and older brothers. So you're the you're the youngest. So that yep. explains why your dad had you at, what, 50? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, about 54, 55, yeah. something like that. Most people are winding down at that point. Yeah. And here comes uh, baby Sorrel. Exactly. Well, my, my dad <laughs> actually came from a, a previous marriage as well where he had two kids. So I actually have two half-sisters, but... Mm-hmm. They're like double my age, so there's not really a connection there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I had... More my, like ants. <laughs> what's that? More like ants. And, More like ants. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then my half-sister, 
had a daughter who had a daughter. So that's where we are right now. So I'm like a half great uncle, yeah. I think you would call it. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of math to do in it's a relationship. It's a lot of math, yeah. <laughs> but, so uh, yeah. the family was getting by, but just barely, you know, yeah, keeping up appearances. Yeah, not... exactly. I mean, I, I, I didn't get any privilege is what I'm trying to say. Like, I never got any mm-hmm. allowance. I never got any, um, you know, it's not like – on my birthday, I'd get like a lump of coal or something. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we were okay. Like I got you a Game Boy. You we weren't were... going through the dumpsters for food, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had a pretty normal childhood, and a very. You didn't get a Ferrari when you turned sixteen either. No, definitely not. I didn't get any kind of car, any kind of no, definitely <laughs> not. But um, yeah. So it, it was uh, it, it was. Well, what, what were was you getting pretty... into as the youngest of the of the three boys? Like uh. Was it sports all the time? Were you a big games guy, video games? Yeah, so I've always been into games, ever since I remember. Mm-hmm. And um, when I look at my family lineage, so have they. Like, my parents are really into gambling, and um, my grandparents were really into bridge. So I come from, like, a long line of gamblers. Yeah, I saw a photo on your Twitter account of you playing uh, Scrabble with your dad recently. yeah. yeah. My, my dad and I play for $5 a game, mm-hmm. and my brother and I have been playing for $5 a point. So <laughs> that's been a lot of fun. That's pretty high stakes. Because we have, huge. like, we, we play for $100 and $5 a point on top of that. And, you know, I I beat him for, like, 150 points one game, and he beat me for, like, 180 the next game. Oof. So it's pretty big swings. Like, Oof. we're talking 1000 bucks. That's a That's, that's a big buy-in. between brothers, too. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're both going to die with money left over, hopefully. So yeah, it's yeah. not, like, a big deal. It's a plan. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I've always loved games. Um, I've always loved gambling, even when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember probably my first – well, there was always bowl, – like, we used to bowl a lot in my family. So there was always, like, you know, gambling on that. But then, like, when I – Well, how I, good – wait, how good were you as a bowler? Not very good. No? I mean, I never got Best to, score. Oh, man. Well, I, I used to play uh, – what was it? Five pin? Yeah, five pin with a small ball. Okay. I don't even remember what the scores were back then. This is like many moons ago. So it's a lot. But I I think it's like in the late 200s. Like that was probably my best score. I remember having a game where I had maybe six or seven strikes. So that's – it was pretty good. Um, so this was a serious family hobby. Yeah. Yeah. It was – my whole family was into bowling. And then um, I remember my first like – my first time bringing gambling to other people outside of my family was uh, playing Pog. Do you remember that game? Like with Pogs? Yeah. And Slammers? Yeah. And Toppers? Yeah, that's of the Of course. One. So that was a huge I thing. was upset. Listen, I got, I think, two years in you. Uh, I'm an 84 <laughs> kid. Yeah. But, but I remember Pogs big time. I had They had okay. all the Skull and Crossbones ones. Yep. Scratch and Sniff Pogs. Scratch and Sniff. I had some Scratch and Sniff, Ooh. some Glow in the Dark. It was a big thing back then. Spinners. Spinners. And those were – spinners were the ones where you have to hit the thing and that's like – okay. Yeah. yeah. And we used to gamble in Pog. So we yeah. used to we used to play for keeps. So whichever ones right. you flipped you over. flip it over. Yep. Goes in your pocket. Goes in your pocket. So I remember being like this – like this kid in grade <laughs> three bringing Pog to my school. Like basically like I brought the fad to my school. Everyone started getting Pog. We started gambling like little degenerates. Mm-hmm. And we played for keeps, and I was doing. There was all sorts of commerce in it as well. Like I remember you selling were like a one pog kingpin. Yeah, pretty much. Just pretty setting much. up in second grade on your <laughs> yeah. throne. Exactly right. <laughs> and uh, you had to go to like the comic book store, like the baseball card shop, to buy pogs. No, there were dollar stores. Like really? I, I grew up in Toronto, where I mean, you could get them anywhere. When when there's a fad in Toronto, they make sure to capitalize yeah. on it. Like the two <laughs> biggest fads during my childhood were probably pog and tamagotchi. Tamagotchi, remember I remember those? that. I remember yeah. Furbies were big for Furbies. a little while. Never got into Furbies personally, but no, too creepy. you can't you can't gamble with Furbies, right? No. <laughs> I mean, you gotta just bet on when they're gonna open their eyes and scare the crap out of you. Exactly. So so, yeah. so games. You're into games. Yep. Video games. Mm-hmm. Um, used to play a lot of Counter Strike. Big. I was big into Counter Strike when I was uh, 15 or 16. Diablo 2 was like the first time I started. Uh, playing a game and actually making real money from it. Now, and what's real money in the video game world? Because I think everyone yeah. in the poker world who thinks of video game money, they think of maybe like Elky and what he was doing back in the day. Or... So I wasn't making money off of going to competitions. I was making money off of selling items. Okay. So I was 
I, I barely played the game, but I was so good at ne negotiating and mm -hmm. like getting good deals and basically hustling that I ended up like creating a mini empire within the mm -hmm. game. So, I mean, I was making like a few thousand dollars a month. What? When I was about 14, Selling 15. virtual items that you can win playing. Well, not win, but yeah, you, you sort of collect them as you play, but yeah. I wasn't playing. So I started off with like a, a base of like, the, okay, so the currency in the game was called SOJs. Those were the rings that were basically the currency in the game. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were some things going on where you could figure out how to dupe them, which was like a big thing and a big problem, but mm -hmm. people were doing it. And I met a few guys and we, we ended up like duping some of them. So I was into controversy from the get-go. <laughs> yeah, you're no stranger to controversy. <laughs> no stranger to controversy. But you that's found, for sure. but you've always been a guy who finds the the yeah, edge. Exactly. So I remember actually, I remember selling a full account with SOJs, which is basically, so you get as in your character, you get like a certain number of slots um, to put items in, and I had about 600 SOJs in this one slot. And SOJs mm -hmm. at the time were worth like, I don't know, I can't remember for sure, but let's say they were worth about three or $4. And I remember selling an account full of them on eBay for like, I don't know, 1,000 to 1,200 bucks. And at the time, and I think it's still this way, when you sell a virtual item and you use PayPal as the means to transfer money, then they don't cover virtual money. So people can actually buy from you and then have it reversed. Yeah. I'm sure they have some kind of safeguard for the, the seller now nowadays, but back then they didn't. So this guy bought this account worth of SOJs and then two weeks later reversed the transaction and I was devastated. Yeah. And just out of like sheer curiosity, I tried the password and he forgot to change the password. Oh man. So I got back into the account, I rechanged the password. Take it right back. Took it right back. <laughs> and then the next day, the next day I saw like a hundred login attempts because you could see whenever someone logged it, tried to log in. So that was that was a pretty big victory. So but, so you were a teenager, you're just making money, selling these things online. Yeah. When did online poker come into the mix? Online poker Believe it or not, I didn't start until I was 18, so I was I was of age. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually rare with uh, most of the uh, boom guys. Yeah, it kind of just happened. I mean, I remember I played I played a little bit with some friends uh, in high school, mm -hmm. and I I really didn't want to play this Texas Hold'em. Like, what is this two card business? Because you know, I used to play with my family like five card draw, which is such an inferior game of poker than Texas yeah. Hold'em. There's, like, there's a lot few, fewer inflection points where there's decisions to happen. Yeah, it's just, it's not even a real, it's it's pretty much like very <laughs> who gets mechanical. Lucky. Yeah. So um, I started playing that and then like within an orbit, I was in love with the game. And then I was in the military from the ages of 16 to 18. And Was we, this self Imposed? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I wanted to. It was okay. an adventure. You know? I wasn't sure if you were sent to some kind of like uh, boot camp. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I, you know, throughout my entire life, sort of like one of my life goals and my life missions is to just accumulate as many positive experiences as possible. You know, that's what I'm all about. That's why I joined the military. That's why I went to Choice Center. That's why, like, you know, I, I basically took a path that not a lot of people take you live life for the stories i live life for the stories and i live life for the adventure mm -hmm. you know because it is an adventure it's one big game and i want to make the game as fun as possible how much of that was being stuck in toronto <laughs> growing <laughs> up not seeing the world i mean I, or was it just a matter of once you got that first little taste of it now you can't get enough well you know i was just a puppy back then right mm -hmm. like i didn't really have any kind of idea of what i wanted to do i was going to high school I wasn't doing particularly well. I wasn't interested. So, you know, like when you're 15 or 16, you kind of have this idea that you know, like what's going on in your life and what you want to do. And you know a lot, like you know more than what people think, you know. And, but then like, as you get older, you kind of look back at yourself like two, three years prior and you're like, wow, what was I thinking? Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, in Toronto, like I never really got to experience Toronto the way I would if I went now, right? Because mm -hmm. now I can go to the nice restaurants, I can see the cool places, I can do all the, the fun stuff. But um, so yeah, so I remember when I was 18 years old, I 
I, my, my brother owed me $500. I can't remember from what, but he wanted to High pay. High stakes Scrabble. <laughs> no, not this time. <laughs> I think I just loaned him money. So he paid me the $500 back on party poker. And um, I didn't want him to at the time because I even at that point I knew myself and I knew that if I started something, I'd I, it would be hard for me to stop. So, um, so we can blame everything from this point on on Marcus. <laughs> yeah, he's he's <laughs> definitely uh, been a big factor. I mean, honestly, like when I think back of all the opportunities I had and all sort of like the whispers from the universe mm-hmm. about like playing poker, I I can honestly say that. Um, I couldn't see myself doing anything else from like the ages of 20 on, you know, like everything kind of guided me into that. Yeah. I, I've always had, uh, you mean like the family being gamblers, you know, your brother sending the money on, on the site. Well, not just that, but just my, my personality type. Like I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Um, uh, because, because, Ninety percent of my high school went to university, and I decided not to. Um, and that was a big decision that I had to make. Um, I just didn't see the the point, you know. And I never saw the point. I didn't. I, I didn't particularly enjoy school, and um, I, I mostly went like and protested simultaneously. Like mm-hmm. I just wasn't into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I could have designed a curriculum that. I was into, but unfortunately the reality that I was living in was like, you know, you have to learn about the various types of salmon in Alaska. And I just, I I just didn't get it. You know, like I understand there's a process and you, it's not about what you learn, but like it's a process of learning how to learn. Learning how to learn. Yeah. But you know, you could learn how to learn more interesting things or more applicable things to real world stuff. And in a much cheaper way. And in a much cheaper way. (laughs) Exactly. So, um, never was into school. Uh, failed grade 10 math. I, that was, that was bad, which a lot of people are surprised about since I'm a poker player. They, mm. they assume that poker players are all, re- <laughs> all re- like really good at math. But, you know, the truth is, is that it's not so much math. It's very basic math and then mostly deductive reasoning that, that, that really like makes people good at poker. Or maybe you just needed everything back then to be in poker word problems. <laughs> yeah. What if tenth grade was just all poker problems? Yeah, yeah, no, that would have. Uh, that Timmy has two aces. <laughs> I, I feel like we'd have a lot more competition <laughs> if that were the case, but, but um, yeah. So, so you take the five hundred bucks from your brother, lose it. You cash <laughs> it out immediately. Do the responsible <laughs> thing. No. Of course, no. Um, I think I with that five hundred dollars, I started playing five ten no limit or five ten limit rather. Okay. Five ten limits. Yeah, let's be responsible and, <laughs> and give ourselves fifty big bets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> five ten limit. That was, and that was not just like the money that my brother owed me. Like that was everything I had. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I'm a kid. I don't have expenses. I don't have any responsibilities. Yeah, you, you lose going, it. You just go back to mom and see what's in the fridge. Exactly. So, but and also, I was going to the. Uh, I was doing the military training that summer, so I knew I was going to make like at least five, six thousand bucks for that summer. So I did that. Um, I lost the 500. I made the five or six thousand, lost that. (laughs) So not a good start to my poker career at all. I don't have one of those stories. Are these the whispers that you're talking about (laughs) from the universe? These whispers telling you to to play poker? These were not the whispers. These were like the... If I had heard those whispers, I don't think I'd be in the industry. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny because like it started off as, as kind of like an addictive habit. Mm-hmm. It started off as something that like something that I I did because I was kind of addicted. Um, but then it like formed into something that I was really good at. So I got lucky because I got to channel my addiction and my degeneracy into something that would end up being positive because I got really good fast. And I, I started figuring out what it what is it in poker that I'm best at and um and then, like, just play more of that. And what was that? Be just being aggressive? No, well, just tournaments. You know, I mean, I mean the type of poker. Like, I Got used it. to, I was playing, like, huge limit. That was the most fun for me because it was fast. It was quick. You could make a lot of money in a very short amount of time. Um, and People make quick decisions, and pots can get bloated pretty fast, yeah. Exactly. Heads up limit. It goes click, 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 click. Like, there's just a lot of clicking <laughs> and a lot of big pots. And I remember, like, at one point, 
anytime I had fifty dollars in my account, I would play five ten, which is like the the minimum you can buy in. And then if I got up to one hundred and fifty, I would play thirty sixty. <laughs> and then if I got up to uh, five hundred, I'd play a <laughs> fifty one hundred, and I would just keep running up, like or so running would, down. You would kamikaze your roll over and over again until it got all the time to a certain point. Yeah, and then Net Teller came out with Instacash, <laughs> <laughs> which was really dangerous for me, um, because basically what what they did was they connected your Net Teller with your bank account, and you were able to deposit money on a poker site without that money coming out of your bank account until the next day. <laughs> so. I think at one point I got to get up to like seven thousand dollars, <sighs> because I built credit with them over time. Yeah. Because what I would do is I would I would uh, deposit money with Net Teller into cash, and then if I, and then I would hopefully have enough money the next day to cover it, and if I didn't, then you know like I, I had a relationship with them. Like I, there was one person that I always talked to, and I was they're like, oh, you lost again. It's Sorel again. Yeah, it's Sorel again. <laughs> He needs more money. <laughs> nah, he's always paid us back. It's all good. Pretty much, yeah. I got he's credit. He's good for it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, man, it's a good thing you didn't become addicted to like online roulette or something. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a disaster. Would have been hard to find the edges there. <laughs> it would have been. I fell in love with poker really early, and I loved the like. I used to play home games in Toronto as well, mm-hmm. and you know I wasn't that good at the time. Like, even when I was playing with the military guys, like, I was probably, like, fourth or fifth best out of, like, 15. But then over time, like, I started seeing patterns. And I started um, recognizing ways to make money and ways to uh, exploit people in in these different various spots. And over time, like, I mean, I look back at the hand histories because I still have them saved from, like, 2006, (laughs) 2005, and it's a disaster. But... (laughs) Somehow what I was doing, even though a lot of the times it was blind aggression, was working because most people played passive. So, you know, back then there were there were certain things I did like if this person did this, I would do that 100 percent of the time, (laughs) like without any sort of thought. Like, for example, if someone raised me really quickly after the flop, I would auto re-raise them. And my reasons for that were. Um, if they really had a good hand, they would have thought about how to extract the most value. And it worked until about 2012 when everyone like started playing. I can't believe it took that long for everyone to, you know, pick up on what everyone was doing. But yeah, yeah. But there was, I didn't really realize what the rationale behind it was. I just remember doing it and it working and not stopping. And then all of a sudden the hundred rebuys started getting a little tough. And then people like, (laughs) and I'm talking about, I would three, I would re-raise anything. And then I like after a while I kept running into sets and weird things, so I just stopped. Completely. The weird timing tells that yeah. <laughs> don't work anymore. Exactly. It worked for a while. You were number one in the world in two thousand seven. Mm-hmm. Had a few million in online earnings. Uh, what was life like back then when you were before you were playing live and you were just, you know, this guy in his room making millions? Yeah, that's what it was. It was a guy in a room like just making a lot of money and not having any balance in life really. Like I remember my my routine consisted of like rolling out of bed, going on the computer, ordering Swiss Chalet, which is like this rotisserie chicken place in Toronto, <laughs> um, getting like the, the six pack of soda and um, then ordering pizza like for, at, so I had two meals a day that were just <laughs> terrible for my health. Um, so I gained a lot of weight. Like I was a skinny kid and then I just gained, oh. It's the same story for everyone who spent some time at number one. <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> yeah. You, you talk to Steve Gross. He says the same thing. Really? Ari said the same thing. He would like smoke two packs a day in a basement, like Jeez. trying to grind online. Yeah. You know, Mormon said he went through a phase like that too. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it was surreal, right? Like I'm just this random kid in Toronto who is is doing really well in poker and all of a sudden like i'm being recognized as the best player in the world online um and no one like knew what i looked like were you still living with, with mom and dad no no oh, okay by then you had branched out and yeah got your own place yeah i moved out when i was about 17. So, okay yeah so yeah you mentioned in, in uh in joey's podcast that like y- y- the way you grew up was like let's get ours you know but you know what i mean let's Type get of- ours like well, you mentioned that, you know, you had the story about, you know, your mom and like, uh, was it the movie theater and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Always trying to beat the system. Exactly. Yeah. 
That's interesting to me. I had a dad like that. My dad was like that. Is that right? Always trying to show me the angles. <laughs> and like, no, don't trust what he's saying. There's a way you can get that cheaper if you know somebody. You right. Know? And I think that's been one of my best and worst qualities. Mm-hmm. Right. Because you can definitely take it too far. Um, but I, I pride myself in uh, seeing things that people don't. And I pride myself in, um, you know, being a, a good negotiator in spots where people wouldn't care. I mean, it's <laughs> not it's not like I'm I'm cheap, but I like to get good deals. It's like this personal satisfaction mm-hmm. that I get. So, but um, then you could take it too far, and you could take it too far, and be know. that guy. Yeah, exactly. So it's just it's just about finding that balance, and you know, like I feel like we're all sort of born with pretty much the same minds um and then like throughout our experience living as kids and living as teenagers certain things are planted inside of our brains and it's like the nurture it's nurture right and then it's like it's kind of like we're computers right like we we're getting all this information and then as you get older you kind of have to go and self-edit some of that stuff you kind of have to go back into the the operating system and you have to delete some files you have to like <laughs> add some files and you you start getting better and better and becoming a more balanced human being and you know that's what i've been working on for the last like five to ten years and well been... it definitely seems like uh you have been working on it at least according to what uh, i've seen you put out there in response to some of the scandals or whatever you want to call them, the controversies back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I particularly like a tweet you made last summer where in May you said, looking forward to the 10K ta- team event, it's the one time I can take over for someone in the middle of the tournament without anyone getting mad. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's nice that you could, like, poke fun at yourself and then say, you know, I, I fucked up back then. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely fucked up. But I, I also think that there's like varying degrees of fuck up mm-hmm. and um, everything is about context. Right. So back when I did uh, do what I did, which is like, you know, I bought an account for someone in the middle of a tournament. Right. Um, Somebody was deep in the uh, one of the big online tournaments and you said, hey, I'll take this account over for you. You played the rest of the tournament. You won. Yeah. They took the money from you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But um I think that, you know, back then my mentality was like, I want to start a website where I can do this on a wider scale. I I want to capitalize on this. Like, I want to have a business where people can come to me and my team. And I had like a lot of players that wanted to do this, like that are really well known now who Mm -hmm. did it, but didn't get caught. Though I won't mention their names, but we wanted to start a team. We wanted to start a team of people like 10, 20 coaches that would coach people at late in the tournament and receive all the profit or a certain percentage and do some kind of business with it. And this was like an idea that we wanted to like make public. So you can imagine my shock when like I got banned from Full Tilt and ostracized from the community. Right. Um, But you were doing something that other people were doing Mm -hmm. clearly and that you clearly saw no problem with because you were wanted to make a legitimate business out of it. Right. And then all of a sudden, because you're number one in the world, we got to make an example. Right. That's what, that's how I feel like it went down. Um, it's just one of those things like there were a lot of people at the time that I knew had multiple accounts and I knew that Full Tilt knew about it mm-hmm. and I knew that they didn't care. And unfortunately, um, what the sites have done historically, or at least Full Tilt, was instead of like changing the rule and letting people know what's going on, they use someone to make an example out of and then everyone knew. Um, and there's, there's many examples of that throughout poker, but that's, that's just the way it was. And, uh, you know, that was, that was very difficult for me because I felt like sort of a hero in the poker world, like someone who came from nothing to, to, uh, build this like empire. And then I felt that sort of taken away from me. So there was this little bit of like resentment and like not wanting to be involved with poker people and just kind of, um, uh, a little bit of like self-loathing about it. But well, you also talk uh, in another interview about the hypocrisy of it all, because you felt that you had been robbed and cheated before, screwed over by whatever situation, mm-hmm. and that you felt like that's just you know why are they coming after me when I had been 
Well, I, w- I think I've like matured. I don't know when I said that, but like I think I've matured enough to the point where like just because someone wrongs me doesn't mean I should wrong other people. Mm-hmm. You know, like I have been cheated out of a lot of money. I have been robbed and ho- like I've had my safe broken into. I've I've been cheated in a hotel game for a lot of money. Things like that have happened. But just because it happens to you doesn't mean you should go around and do it to other people. Right. So. Um, and, and look, like the reality of it is like, if we're going to talk about this, um, that they like a lot of it is fake news mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, to borrow, <laughs> to borrow a line from Donald Trump. Yeah. And, uh, it really is like, it, it's just twisted in like the worst light possible. And like, I don't know, it's just one of those things. It's human nature, unfortunately, but people love a good story that involves a controversy Mm -hmm. and people love bringing people down and people it's it makes themselves feel better about themselves or it makes them feel better about themselves um that being said there are things that i've done that i'm not proud of and but i'm just i'm growing you know i'm living this life and like i said i'm going back into the operating system and I'm deleting files. I'm self-editing. Self-editing, and yeah. and I know, like you know, I use that as a metaphor. But um, I read this great book called "You Are the Placebo," which actually like brings it onto the scientific front and talks about how you can actually self-edit and create a new person within yourself and like switch things on and off from an epigenetic standpoint. Um, and I, I found it fascinating. And uh, you know, I've just been. Uh, I've been really fascinated by that book and I'm, I'm really glad I read it because it, it, it really blew my mind in a sense to the power of the brain and the power of uh, our ability to like edit certain things. And um, I was, yeah, I've been, I've been trying to capitalize on that for sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about live poker and how that changed your world because you've obviously put together quite a career on the, on the live felt almost 12 million in earnings um let's see what was the first big one was it like 08 the first big one well there was the irish open um which i i shot for like six hundred thousand euros and that was like the first really big one and the first the first live result i had was um i think it was in barcelona you see, oh, let's see. The Irish Open was 2007. Okay. Officially, you finished third for 280,000. Right. Yeah, officially. <laughs> officially. Yep. I'm glad to hear you got a little bit more than official there. It, it, you know what? If it was 280,000, I definitely didn't get 600K. But that was for third. So maybe with the deal. Yeah, maybe. But it was probably like four or 500. It was probably 600 American, is what it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Marty Smythe. Roland DeWolf. Yeah, that's that where I met Roland. Deal. No, Marty got 867000 oh, for really? first. Okay. So it might have been six hundred. It was 600 then. <laughs> yeah, it was six hundred. <laughs> you didn't get all I was, that, Marty. <laughs> I was chip leader, like, by quite a bit when we made the deal. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. The big one's uh, third in uh, the Asia Millions for $2 million. That's got to be, obviously, life-changing money. Uh, second in the Aussie Millions... For 900k, third in the Aussie Millions for 638k, fourth in the 100k of PCA, third in Monaco Super High Roller. A lot of big, uh, close calls. Yeah. At the top of your resume. Definitely. I'm wondering if you look at that at, at your resume and and go, this is amazing, or oh, what if? It's a little of both. A little of both. It's a little of both. I mean. Because I, you know, Aussie Millions is a great example of a tournament that if I just did a little bit better in like a few more spots, I would have like had <laughs> four won titles. <laughs> no, I mean, I've gotten first or I've gotten second, third, ninth, 16th <laughs> in Aussie Millions. Um, so that's kind of like my tournament. And, you know, the time I got 10th, I lost with like pocket eights versus ace king on an ace eight three board. So if I oh. won that, that would have been a little different. Maybe, maybe I would have made another official final table. And Wait, how did that run out? I want to know how dirty was, that was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was oh, it was really dirty. It was uh, wait, it was ace eight three, and it came like three ace or something. That's yeah. so gross. Yeah, it was it was insane. It was <laughs> yeah, and that was for like the chip lead pot. So um, that one hurt. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you always wonder because I've I've gotten second into uh, WSOP events, third in a WSOP event. 
So if I just did a little better at the end game, like I would have had more titles. But, you know, like as I get older, the titles don't really mean as much. Like mm -hmm. it's just kind of a um, – the way I look at it is if I get second for 200K, I just won the Sun a million. Like, you know, I'll just yeah. look at it like that rather than uh, <laughs> think about the bracelet. <laughs> Maybe I'm just using that, like looking at it like that. Just That's what I'm wondering defense. because, you know, when you yeah. get those close calls – because you've won a lot of live tournaments, but they've been like high rollers where you don't necessarily, you know, get a piece of jewelry with them or yeah. – uh, or they haven't been the big, you know, main events. So, yeah, how much of that is you just saying, yeah, you know, if it happens, it's it happens. It's probably a lot of that. Yeah, it's probably me just being, like, a little bit sour. So you don't it. have bracelet envy or anything like that? I mean, I like to say I don't, but I'd like a bracelet also. You know, it would be <laughs> nice. <laughs> no. what's, your, what's your schedule look like these days? Oh, you know, I've been doing a lot of nothing lately. Mm -hmm. I've been playing this video game called uh, <laughs> Player Unknown Battlegrounds. Okay, what oh, is this? It's called PUBG for short, and it's it's like a battle royale. Have you ever heard of um, what's that other one? Fortnite. I've heard of that, but I haven't played it. Okay, so basically, you start with like a hundred people, and you parachute into this this big world where you pick up items and you battle other players. And whoever lives the longest wins the game. You get a winner, winner, chicken dinner if you come first. <laughs> it's awesome. It's a lot of fun. And, and this has taken over your life so much that you've stopped working? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, look, I have a puppy as well now. Oh, so yeah. So that's taking up a lot of time. Um, I love my puppy so much. He's like seven <laughs> months old, and I've always wanted a dog when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And now I finally have one. And, um, you know, I take him out all the time. I I take him everywhere. Like even if I go grocery shopping, he's there with me. Yeah, how are you gonna travel with a with a puppy like that? Uh, yeah, I don't travel as much as I used to, but when people when people approach me that work at the grocery store or in the restaurant, I always just say the emotion. Yeah, he's an emotional therapy dog. You know, look at him. Oh like, yeah, you're one of those people. Yeah, I'm one of those people. Take what, full you, advantage. What have you getting kicked out of with a dog? There's been a couple sushi restaurants that didn't let me in. <laughs> There's been, uh, especially like there was this all you can eat one that didn't let me in because for obvious reasons, maybe yeah. they thought I was going to feed him. But um, yeah, most places are pretty cool in Vegas. In Toronto, not so much. Yeah. But in Vegas, I can go almost anywhere and no one Do really. Do you split your time between Vegas and Toronto or? I, I spend a lot of time in various places. I, I I was back in Toronto a few months ago for the Niagara tournament and to see my parents, but. Are you a, are you a, well, I don't want to ask you about your citizenship, but do you have to go back every, every few months? Um, How does it work with the. I don't have to. I, I've, I'm actually under a P1 visa. Okay. So, which is like for athletes. So I can actually like stay in the U.S., but I don't like I'm. I'm going back to Canada a lot, and I'm I'm traveling to Europe, and I'm just a global citizen, man. Yeah. I don't want to be bothered, man. I don't want to put down roots. Yeah. I, I like I like exploring the world. You know, I like seeing different cultures. I like um, the opportunity that poker has afforded me to like basically do something I love and visit all these places that are really cool. Well, let's talk about some of them. What's the best vacation you ever took for work or for fun? Um, I would say... I mean, you've been everywhere at this point, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, most most places I go to vacation are, like, working vacations. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't really justify just going on a pure vacation um, just because, like, why would I? Like, I get to travel to all these cool places. I can make a vacation out of it. Yeah, I think the only one I, I see a lot of poker players do is, like, Thailand. Because there's yeah, not really you know a lot in Thailand to That's do. true. I've Poker been to wise. Thailand a few times. That's one of the places. It's, <laughs> yeah. That's a nice little vacation spot. Um, I love Barcelona. I love Melbourne. Um, those are my two favorite places to go for poker. And um, Well, Melbourne because of the results, I'm sure. Yeah, that's a big reason. But also it's like you don't usually go to the best. Like when you, when you go to these tournaments, a lot of times you're going to um, – the country at, at like a sh like on the off season, just so you could they could fill the hotels. That's and... what Scott Seaver said. Oh, did he? Yeah, he said he said the, the the secret about the poker world is that everything's off season, and that's why it's so cheap and they have so many rooms available. Yeah, so yeah, you're but... always going to like the beach when it's cold or right because you know they'll go. <laughs> yeah, the people know they'll go. The so... desert in the summer. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but uh, but Melbourne is different because Melbourne you get prime time you get. January in Melbourne is like the summer. Yeah. And the weather is beautiful. And the city is so futuristic. 
It's so beautiful there. It's like everything is, it's like you're living in 2030. And the people are super nice, super progressive. Um, this is great for my listeners because Australia is like our third biggest listener, no, fourth biggest listener. Is that right? I love the Aussies. I love going to Aussie and having some brekkie, cooking some steak <laughs> on the barbie. <laughs> that's, their, that's their little lingo right there. What, uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about, we've had a few, what is it, burner? Is that what you call yourself? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, that's we've had a few us. burners on this podcast. Scott Seaver, Justin Bonomo, I think Brian Rast mm-hmm. is, a, is a guy. Lindy Johnson, everyone knows. Every oh, really? Year. No, I didn't that's know. A joke. <laughs> that was a surprise. The rest I've, I know for a fact have been, but Linda Johnson. Can you can you uh, put it into words, or what, what is what is the way you describe it to people? Oh man, it's basically like everyone coming to a, in the middle of the desert and bringing them their best selves, and even if they're not bringing their best selves, their best self comes out because the environment. And the, um, yeah, the environment is so uh, enabling for people to be themselves. So you go there and you just connect, at least for me personally. I just connect with so many strangers. I mean, I met two girlfriends from there. You know, that ended up being like significant relationships. Um, and it's, it's so hard to describe. They say that's, it's that's, like, that's why I always ask. Yeah, they, they say it's like <laughs> explaining the, the color red to a blind person. That's like the common thing they say. But the best way I can describe it is... I feel like that's offensive to blind people, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, blind listeners like, fuck, sorry, you don't want to see red. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is an absolute mind-blowing experience. Mm-hmm. You go there and you are basically overwhelmed, like your sensory perception is overwhelmed. You go on the playa the first time and you see the lights and you see the music, you hear the music and you you see the people and it's just like, it's like you're on a different planet. In <laughs> fact, like I was on mushrooms once at Burning Man. I was looking at the, up at the moon and you, when, you're, when you're looking, when you're at Burning Man and when you're in the mil- middle of the playa, it's kind of like you feel like you're on the moon a little bit. Okay. Like the, it's, it's kind of the same. Yeah, it's like craggly. Yeah, and, it's craggly. Know. It's like desert, ground and stuff. So, so I remember looking up at the moon and thinking, like, had this thought, well, maybe we're on the moon and the moon is really Earth and we're kind of just looking at it. it it's really, though, like... Playa dif- thoughts. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's a di- I was on mushrooms. What can I say? <laughs> uh, it's a different planet. It, it, it's... it's um, and, and I feel like our society could use more of Burning Man. Like, it could use more of the, the sort of, like, loving, tribal sort of... Um, more socialist environment than and that and that's kind of the point like you know one of the things our camp does that's pretty unique is you know a lot of people get upset because we're what's known as a plug and play where we go with the rvs and um a lot of people go with tents and they're like oh you're not doing it right man you're not getting the full experience man but no i am getting the full experience well, I'll, just, i like, will never go but if i don't have an rv it's definitely not happening yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's just it's all it's about comfort right? yeah um, so, but we do some things in our camp that are, that are pretty unique. Uh, like we, one of the things that I really love about our camp, it's called Camp Epic is, uh, and every single person that you mentioned has been a part of that camp at <laughs> one point, except for Linda Johnson. I've never <laughs> seen her there. That's what I was kind of wondering. But, um, one of the things we do is we give out like 500 to a thousand hamburgers per day on the barbecue. Like we do a barbecue from two o'clock to four o'clock every day. And um, there's nothing I love more than that. There's nothing I love more than just being a part of that. Like sometimes I'll go into the line with like a spritzer and spritz people and just connect with them. And I mean, we're talking about people who have been eating like trail mix and Mm -hmm. cliff bars for the last three, four days. (laughs) And I'm coming here with like a cheeseburger. So you look at like the gratitude and like the love (laughs) and the, oh my God, thank you in their eyes. And it's just, you get this feeling of like, you know, you feel good about yourself. So if um, someone wants to describe Burning Man to me as like a good purge, a good purge, like if the purge was a good thing, <laughs> okay, all right, I can't really see a purge being a good thing, but I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> instead of murdering everybody, you show love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of like the opposite of a purge, but um, <laughs> it's it's an incredible experience, and and you, um, it's it's the perfect environment. Like if you. Uh, if you are ever curious about exploring your own consciousness, 
there's no environment that beats Burning Man because you're around so many like loving beings and even people who aren't really like that lovey-dovey in the real world like I feel like they connect to that vibration and you get to experience people again at their best um and then you know when you go back home everyone kind of just turns back to assholes again but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Speaking of uh, Brian Rast, um, you beat him in a charity boxing match a couple years ago. How's your how's your right hook these days? Haven't really been uh, do, throwing too many right hooks lately. How did that happen? Like how like how does that happen? Where you're just like I'm gonna fight you for charity, <laughs> and neither of us are fighters. Well, it wasn't really for charity at first. You know, we were gonna fight and we were gonna bet on it, and that's what we did. And then, but was this? through animosity or was this because of like it was just like a pissing contest like I can beat you up oh I can beat you up or <laughs> Brian and I have always had kind of like a like I, I love Brian like I think he's like really funny really smart like I like being around this guy um, but we've gone into like a lot of really intense like arguments like really <laughs> heated arguments and I remember like six or seven years ago at LAPC we were talking about doing it that was like the first time and Antonio was kind of egging us on. Of like, course he was. You know, he took the picture of us, like, <laughs> face to face. And, and it, nothing really came of it. And then I think we were on a boat. We were doing wake surfing or something. And it was brought up. And I was having, like, I was, I had just fallen in love. Like, I was uh, on top of the world. Like, I felt like some kind of crazy cosmic energy that I couldn't really explain. And this guy challenges me to a boxing match. And... I'm like, you know what? If I'm ever going to do that, this, this is going to be the time. And then, like, I talked to my, my girlfriend at the time, and she was kind of trying to talk me out of it. She's like, yeah, I think it's great, but there's probably better things you can do with your time. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, you're right, but at the same time, this is, like, literally a way of killing three or four birds with one stone. Like, not only am I going to get in good shape, which I was, like, in decent shape at the time, but I could get in, like, six-pack shape. But also, I get to learn a new skill. Playa shape. <laughs> yeah, playa shape, exactly. <laughs> I get to learn boxing. I get to learn something that will help me um, in, in many situations for the rest of my life. And um, so I just decided to do it. And But at some point, like I was like, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And I, I tried to buy out. I actually tried to buy out for like... Um, well, how actually, much was you know the what? bet for? It, it, was, uh, it was for like 30000 I think. Okay. And... I actually didn't try to buy out. I said, I asked them, I was like, look, man, like, I don't know if I want to be doing this right now. Like I have lots of things going on. I don't know if I want to work on this. Do you mind if we just cancel it? And this was like the day after we booked the bet. And he's like, no, Sorrel, you know what? Like you, if you want to buy out, you have to buy out for 5,000 bucks. And I'm like, you know what, Brian, let's box. Let's go. Five is reasonable. It's reasonable, but I just, just out of principle. But that shows you how little you really wanted to quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you really wanted to quit, you would have taken five. Exactly. I didn't yeah. really want to quit. I was I was on the fence. Yeah. And having to pay $5,000 definitely pushed me on the other end of the fence. I was like, no. So I ended up, like, training super hard. It was, it was the first time in a long time that I've had, like, a very strict regimen, a very strict routine. I was waking up every morning. Oh, completely and, foreign concept to poker players. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's – it's important for poker players to, to build that structure – because um, no one's going to do it for you. You don't have a job. Uh, so, you, you know, I talk about structure, but I'm playing video games 12 hours a day these days. But It's a vacation. Yeah, it's a vacation. It's a little You're sabbatical. on maternity leave as yeah. far as I'm concerned. <laughs> exactly. That dog needs to grow up at least six years before you can play poker. That's true. That's true. So um, I was meditating every day. I was going to float tanks. I was training with my, my trainer, John. Um, I was doing everything I possibly could. Like I was yelling mantras in the mirror. <laughs> you know, everything I possibly could. What was your strength? You have a good jab, a nice uppercut. I had, a, ni- I had a nice hook during nice the hook? left hook. Left yeah. hook. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't work on right hooks at all. Are you lefty? I'm a righty, but left hook. I, I don't know. I guess you're supposed to hook with the opposite hand. Like the hook is when you shows go... how little I know about yeah. boxing. <laughs> I don't know, but trying right, to hook you cross with, my... with the right. Yeah, you cross with the right hook with the left the opposite of golf exactly okay. and we only you know we we kept it really simple but we did things like repetitively so you know like there was the one two two and one two one and like there were only like four or five different things that we worked on but we worked on them all the time and 
you know, like we didn't try to get fancy play syndrome when it comes to boxing. <laughs> we just kept it very basic. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Um, I I had a instead of having a boxing stance during the fight, I had a wrestling stance. And when Brian had the boxing stance, like he he got off balance a lot because the the um, the wrestling stance is kind of like you're sitting down, you're squatting, mm-hmm. and you're more stable. And the boxing one is when both of your feet are sort of lined up, they're parallel. Um, and that, un- unfortunately for Brian, that kind of like, I mean, I was hitting him hard, but it seemed like he was falling over a lot more, like because he was off balance rather than because of the power of my punches. Yeah. And I got to give him credit because he was taking a beating and he just kept getting up. <laughs> but that was a What about night. you? How about that first time you took a, a clean shot to the face? Uh, was there a moment you're like, nope, I'm done? Because I feel like that would be my quitting point. Like the first chin rocker, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I can't do this. Yeah. Well, um, I made sure that when I sparred, I sparred with people who like were fighters you know, people in the UFC. Uh-huh. I got to spar with Forrest Griffin. Really? Yeah. Well, not really spar with him, but he was like chasing me while we were doing some kind of exercise. <laughs> Say whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> you fought Forrest Griffin. Yeah. In a for the title, round I won. <laughs> knockdown fight. That's right. <laughs> no, but yeah. So and then there were like some some guys in the UFC that I that I sparred with, and I went after them. You mm-hmm. know, like I wasn't gonna back down. I went after them, and I I like I jumped into like a couple big punches. And, you know, the first – we sparred on Sundays, right? So the first couple Sundays, like, I took a beating. And, uh, and, and my reaction for getting punched was always to do what everyone who's never got punched does when they get punched is, like, to just cower. You just kind of, like, shift your body and, like, yeah. you know, put your hands over your face and you just look the other way. Which Some is of us say, time out, yeah, I quit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. But over time – um, I just started associating being punched with like a chemical response in the in the brain of like a, a short uh, pain impulse and just kind of mind over mattered it to where like the most important thing for me was to just not turn around and not like get down when I got punched. So once I got over the feeling of getting punched, which it's not a really big deal, especially when you're wearing like gear and they're wearing gloves. It's not a big deal. You just have to get used to the the response that you naturally may have when you get punched. So after doing that, like, and and after feeling confident because I took punches from some of the, like some real people that were like real fighters, I was like, come on, I can take this rascal. Yeah, what's like, what's Brian gonna do? Yeah, exactly. after Forrest Griffin. Right. Uh, speaking of Forrest Griffin, what's your favorite celebrity encounter? I saw some uh, some cool selfies you took on oh. Twitter. Shaq. Shaq, uh, he was cool. I, I, I met him outside of Azusa, the, this hookah lounge here. Um, but my favorite celebrity encounter, one where I was like genu- genuinely starstruck, mm-hmm. was meeting Bill Nye the Science Guy. Bill Nye the Science Guy? Yeah. You know what? That's a cool story. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I That's mean, better than Shaq. Yeah. Like, I grew up watching this guy on TV as a child. <laughs> and then I see him in the casino, like at Aria, just <laughs> walking by the cage. And I had to do, like, a double take, right? Like, I'm like, what is Bill Nye the science guy doing at the Aria? So I had a short little interaction with him. I took a picture with him, and mm-hmm. I was I was so happy. I was like, wow, like, this this is – I never had that feeling. The, the one other time was meeting the, the son of the, the guy who played Tony Soprano. Oh, um, Michael Imperioli? Yeah. No, was it Michael Imperioli? Oh, yeah. That wasn't the son. That was, that was the uh, – that was Snake in that movie, right? The, in uh, Goodfellas. Oh, okay. Wh- okay. What are you talking about? Tony Sopranos. Soprano's son. All right. He Look. plays poker. And I, I used to watch this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. He played in the World Series of Poker. Right. Right, 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 right. And I saw him uh, again at Whole Foods recently. What's his name? I didn't know he lived in, here in town. I don't know if he lives here, but I saw him at Whole Foods a couple Michael weeks Michael Imperioli played like the cousin. That's right. You yeah. Think, we're cousin. talking about Robert Eiler. That guy. Yeah, Robert I played the World Series of Poker. Little Soprano. Little Soprano. So he was <laughs> that was the first time I was starstruck and then um and then yeah, Bill Nye the science guy was the big one. <laughs> Let's see, we got time. Oh, we got some time for some rapid fire questions. All right. Uh biggest pot you ever won or lost? Your choice. Ooh, biggest pot I've ever won or lost. Um Glory or pain? <laughs> Are we talking like a tournament or a cash game? Could be equity, could be a cash pot, 
could be emotional value. So the ca- the cash game one was unfortunately the one where I was cheating in a hotel room, and uh, <laughs> it was it was like uh, I feel like I had ace ace queen versus ace seven on an ace queen seven board, and the seven came on the river and we got all in and uh, that was like a six hundred k pot. Oof, that was that was a lot. Um, and then for tournament, like maybe not the biggest, but one of the more significant ones I can remember was against Phil Helmuth. My first tournament in the U.S. was love uh, Phil stories. Yeah, so we were playing the uh, the twenty five k five diamond, mm-hmm. and uh, I was at his table. First time I've ever played with him, and he he ra- he was raising quite a quite a few hands. Um, and I think I called from the small blind with pocket nines after he raised. That's his hand. That's his hand? He loves pocket Does nines. Does he? Because he won the main event in 89 with them. And oh, really? Wow. I think okay. he also won the NBC Heads Up with them. Well, pocket nines giveth and they taketh away. <laughs> so, And in this case, they took it away. Uh, <laughs> so I played the hand pretty unconventionally. And um, the board came ace, nine, deuce. And I led into him. Weird. Weird, right? And very suspicious. So you have no set. You have a, you have a set. There's zero percent of the time. Congratulations. 0%. No sets. It's just not <laughs> Especially a, back in what 07 when you did this. Yeah, exactly. No <laughs> one plays pocket nines like that. So I led into him. He calls. The turn is a jack, and I I lead into him again. And at this point, he starts talking to himself, and then he starts talking to me, and he's like, "Oh, I think I need another jack to beat you." And um. I've seen him on TV before, and I know that, like, he balances his truth range a lot. (laughs) Like, you know, I know sometimes he's telling the truth, and uh, sometimes he's not. But uh, I've seen more of him telling the truth. Anyway, so the river comes a jack, (laughs) and I'm a little nervous. But, or sorry, you know what? The turn was an ace. So everything is true up until this, but the turn was an ace, and he said, I think I need a jack to beat you. Then Then the river was a jack. Mm-hmm. And I go all in, and I'm I'm not feeling super confident, but I go all in for about three quarters of the pot, and uh, and he ends up like talking to himself, and then eventually calls, and he has a six, and I win a huge <laughs> pot, and that evening he like wrote this blog in his blog, like I don't know how many times he's written blogs about hands, <laughs> but he he kept referring to me as like the internet boy, and <laughs> this internet boy is playing his hand too fast, like he could have. You know, he could have guaranteed maybe half my stack, but instead he went for the full thing. And and I was pretty – I was like, wow, like Phil Helmuth is writing a blog about me. I yeah. don't care if he's calling me an internet Yeah, who player. cares? That's, that, yeah. You made it at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So That's so funny that he lied about his, his kicker. Did he lie and about – And it got yeah, there, yeah. so he decided to call up. Exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, who's the best poker player we've never heard of? Or just somebody who doesn't get all the respect they deserve? Best poker player you've never heard of? Well – I've been playing a lot of cash games at the Bellagio, and there's there's been some people who have impressed me. Um, there's this one guy named I don't know if you guys know Matt Moore. Do you know Matt Moore? Yeah. Okay, so he's I'm not sure if he would. Qualify. Matt Moore was famous for a blog, right? A kid, yeah, a kid with a dream or something. Let's see here. I can give you the exact name. Go ahead. What about yeah. Matt Moore? Yeah, so I think he's a really talented player who doesn't get a lot of credit because he mostly plays cash games, but he's kind of like this unsung hero. That's right. He was the famous 2 plus 2 poster, another kid, another dream. Yeah. So it sounds like things are still going well for Matt Moore. They are, as far as I know. And then another player who's probably a little bit more recognizable that comes to mind would be like someone like Jeremy Osmus. Okay, yeah. You know, a lot of people associate people who make the final table of the main event to just getting lucky, but I really think he's one of, like he's a top-tier player. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't get as much credit because, again, he doesn't play as many tournaments, but I, I think he plays really well. Um, yeah, I interviewed him for a Poker Life podcast. I'm a Poker Life uh, article for Card Player, and I was really impressed by how like put together like the guy was. He seemed like he knew what he was doing in all phases of his life. You know, like yeah, yeah, he had a plan. I was like, he oh wow, a, yeah, exactly. He's very, <laughs> he's one of the few very structured poker players. You know, like he, he's married, he has kids, he's, you know, he's got like a, a life outside of <laughs> the world, which a lot of people don't. So, yeah, those are the two. That uh, best swap or piece you ever got from anybody? Um, I was down so much in swaps. <laughs> well, you have $12 million in earnings. <laughs> That's kind of your fault. And then, and then, <laughs> uh, 
who was it? It was an anatomic medic just oh. randomly in the hallway. I've never swapped with him in my life. Fellow Canadian. Fellow Canadian. We say hi to each other. It was the worst high of his life because <laughs> I'm like, like, hey, you want to do a friendly 10% swap in the 10K pot limit hold'em event? And he kind of like, he, you know, he's probably not the type to usually swap, but at the same time, we're both Canadian and, you know, he's yeah. feeling the love and he's like, yeah, let's do it. 10% shake on it. He wins the tournament. So that was probably the best swap <laughs> that I've ever that I've ever had. And probably how'd you do in that tournament? Not well. Not I think well. I, I think I busted on day one. Like, okay. So he didn't even have a shot. Like he didn't even have a sweat. It was one of those. That's a good swap for yeah. you. <laughs> uh, what about uh, Dgen stories, prop bets? So many of them. I know. What's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, Dgen or prop bet story? Just pick one. Pick one. Could be a loss. Could I mean, be I a could win. I turbo off a few of them. Like when Go I, for it. When I roll in, when Roland and Roland DeWolf and I used to hang out, we used to have all sorts of weird prop bets. Uh, we used to play Monopoly for a lot of money. Uh, we used to like replace the fake cash with real cash. Pretty or? much. Well, no, we had rules. Okay. So like, if I rolled double six, I'd make two thousand bucks. <laughs> if I landed on jail while he was in jail, that would be like five k. Like it was really <laughs> big games. That's a high stakes Monopoly game. And the best, the craziest thing is, we played on the site called um, Pogo.com. I think it was. It's like the site with all these different games, and it's a, it's a thirty turn game. So you only get 30 turns. Okay. And then, like, the way it works is that if you're playing with two people, two computers take the other spots. And sometimes the, <laughs> the computers trade with each other. And they and sometimes the computers trade with you. And it's just completely random. Oh, no. No, what happened is, is we, we decided that it was me – me and one of the random computers versus Roland and one of the random computers. That's what happened. And then sometimes, like, with one turn left, I'm drawing completely dead. And then the computer will just make an asinine trade. Like, the <laughs> worst trade possible that will, like, give me the win. And that happened a lot. It's like a blue shell in Mario Kart. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and then, uh, so there, there was that. And then Roland, I, I remember Roland and I bet, on like Ari Angle, wh- whether his name was Ari or not, and I said <laughs> it's yes. It's not. It's not right. It's Alan. It's Alan. But we bet a ridiculous amount of money <laughs> on this, and he was giving me odds, and that's, okay, that's such a bad negotiation. I mean, like, he must have sold it really well. He's like, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think maybe it's Alan. Yeah, that was a bad bet. That was one of the worst bets I've ever made. That's pretty terrible. Because I wasn't confident, but somehow I was, like, standing to lose, like, $50,000 <laughs> on someone's name. And, like, the only way that someone would bet that someone's name isn't their name is if they knew. Yeah. But what ended up happening was, like, Perry Friedman came over that night, and we ended up, like, settling the bet that evening. And um, his given name was actually Ariel. Uh-huh. That was his, like, given Hebrew name. Uh so I ended up only having to pay like 5k of it, which I was very, I was thrilled about. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty nice rebate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. One more. One more is, uh, again, an, another Roland one where, um, we were in Bahamas and randomly he, we made a bet that I had to get, uh, <laughs> I had to get Juan Barboza to change his relationship status to in a relationship with me <laughs> for, for 24 hours. And I had 24 hours to do it. Um, and I'm not allowed to call him. I can only like contact him through Facebook or see him. And I, I won that bet. I mean, I just, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And then I just <laughs> contact him through Facebook. I'm like, yo, let's do this. Da, 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 this is why. I mean, we just did random things like that all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see when you got your headphones on at the table, what are you listening to? Um, there's a one, there's one like amazing set from burning man with above and beyond, if you if you SoundCloud the word yoga, I think it's the second result, and it's this twenty five to twenty eight minute uh, uh, song or melody that I just can't get enough of. You just I, play it on repeat. I do sometimes, and then sometimes I listen to podcasts. I listen to like Joe Rogan podcast, mm-hmm. Aubrey Marcus podcast, um, and then but poker that's, stories, <laughs> poker stories all the time, <laughs> <laughs> and then. Um, uh, you should catch that Lindy Johnson episode. Uh, yeah. Hear all about Burning Man. Okay. <laughs> but uh, normally that's, like, I'll only listen to podcasts if I'm in, like, a really, like, if I'm on autopilot. Like, if it's day one of a $1,500 tournament. and Yeah, for me it's driving. Driving? Yeah. yeah. 
So I'll listen. Yeah, but when I play poker, that's usually the only time. And then um, I like rap and I like classical music. Like uh, I like Frank Sinatra. I'll listen to that a lot. So modern classical music. Modern classic and sometimes even like Beethoven or Mozart. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, which poker pro did you admire coming up and did you ever get to play a pot with him or her? Yeah, I mean, I've played pots with pretty much everyone in the poker world that mm-hmm. I admire. Or um, Luckily, I've been on the table, or I don't know if luckily is the right word, but I've got to be on the table with some of like the biggest players. And um, I would say Daniel is one of them, Daniel mm-hmm. Legrano. Uh, he's, he's always been someone I've kind of looked up to. Uh, well, he was like... I'm guessing him and I guess Gavin Smith were like the big Canadian stars yep. back when you were first starting. Exactly. And uh, Daniel actually went to the same high school as me. Oh, really? We went to the same high school at different times and grew up in the same neighborhood. And uh, we actually did a Choice Center together. He was in my group. so I, Does we... Daniel's high school have a plaque of him or, or, or something? No. Okay. No. <laughs> but, he, I mean, everyone I'm has... Just, a... I was just wondering, like, <laughs> do, do you celebrate a guy like that being alumni? Uh, One of the world's greatest gamblers? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they really celebrate anyone, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> there's, some, there's some interesting people that have come out of AY. It, it's called AY Jackson, the high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we you know, I, I kind of had that bond with them. After Choice, you know, we, we... I mean, Choice is basically, like, stripping you of your ego... And getting down to the core human being of who you are at some points. So I got to see that of him and he got to see that of me. And, you know, we had that, that, that was really, um, powerful. And, um, but yeah, I've always, I've always admired his, his table antics. I've always thought he was really like, he was good for poker mm-hmm. and good, good, like a good sort of person, a character because poker needs characters. You need those people that are, um, eccentric and, uh, opinionated and, I've always, yeah, when you first play with these guys, it's kind of like a huge shock. You know, the first time I played with Ivy, the first first time I played with Daniel, it's like, wow, like I'm sitting here right now. Yeah. Like I'm now playing with the world's best and I'm identifying things that they're doing that I can exploit. (laughs) You know, and it's like um, when you do that and then you really sort of feel a sense of belonging and a a sense of like wow like I, I belong here so. and also he's just a dude he's just a dude he's just a dude he's just a dude everyone's exactly. just, everyone's human everyone's yeah. got weaknesses to exploit yep <laughs> um what was the worst job job you had before poker did you I have really any jobs any, i mean i had yeah I, I used to deliver newspapers okay so that was a on big a bicycle one. or um my mom actually woke up like every morning at 6 a.m and drove so your around. mom delivered newspapers <laughs> well she drove me around <laughs> i i placed the newspapers at the door so give me a little credit you didn't even throw them no i didn't throw them oh I, that's I tried that be, like the number one like perk of being a newspaper <laughs> delivery person i know i should have developed a better system but no i was <laughs> i was i was placing them but um yeah, I delivered and I collected the money for it. And I mean, that was like a good character building job. And then Radio Shack was another one. I used to work at Radio Shack, which is now the source. And then, yeah, I got, I got fired from there and I got fired from my telemarketing one. Why'd you get fired? <laughs> Radio Shack was just like, I, I was one of the best um, at selling extended warranties i was really aggressive <laughs> like i loved the and extended warranties are pretty much a scam but like like they show you the percent at which you sell extended warranties at like in the entire district and i was number one um and i was in competition with this guy i'll never forget his name was zishan and we would like uh we would want to try to sell um things in equally aggressive ways and I remember, like, he always had this tactic. Like, he'd been there for five years, so he knew the ropes. Mm-hmm. And he always, he always had this tactic of when the store was empty or not very busy, like, he would be at the front. So he would be, like, like the first person that someone saw. Yeah. So, like, one day I was like, you know what? This is this is nonsense. Like, why should, why should I let this guy get all the first sales? So I, like, I took a step, like, a, f- a little further than him. <laughs> and then, like, he immediately responded by going a little further. And we... Like, at the end, we were both, like, standing at the storefront. And because uh, we, we were at, like, a plaza. So we it's were like right weird at... passive-aggressive competition at <laughs> exactly. Radio Shack. So there was, like, a lot of tension there. And then there was tension with my boss who, funny enough, I ran into at Niagara Falls, like, after 10 years. And he's like, oh, oh really? Yeah. But um, 
I, I think he the, took all the credit for your success. He's like, <laughs> I hadn't have fired you. <laughs> I think I left an iPod out once, and that was kind of like the, <laughs> the the nail in the coffin. And then the the telemarketing job, again, I, I really excelled at that. I was really good at sales uh, over the phone. I was selling like credit card insurance. <laughs> um, <laughs> super shady, right? But uh, they were like, I remember when I when I sold. And when I was on the phone with these people, I would have a conversation with them as if I was having a conversation with you randomly or right now. Yeah, I already got my wallet out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to buy. Yeah. Like one of the one of my biggest pet peeves is like when I call customer service and it's like they're reading off a prompter and they're 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 um, they're just robots, right? Yeah. So like I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see in the world, right? There so you I, go. I was just being myself and there was one conversation that got flagged because it was like an hour and a half. <laughs> so I was on the phone with this lady for an hour and a half. Did you make the sale? I ended up not making the sale. That's probably why they cared. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a great conversation. And I, I felt like I, I really, um, yeah, I was, I, I was myself. And I remember it was like an hour and a half. And then my boss the next day said, look, your, one of your conversations got flagged. It was the one that it was an hour and a half. We're going to have to write you up for this. Like you just have to sign this. And say say that you're not going to do this again and this is what you should do and this is what bureaucracy you and i was like no i'm not going to do that and then i just left it at that and then the next day that i came in they they told me i have to leave so <laughs> but again you i think was, your boss would go to bat for you be like he's good at it yeah let him have this one i mean i get it from their perspective nobody right? bats a thousand yeah i mean everyone has to be like uniform everyone has to be like a cookie cutter mold in that kind of business. Mm -hmm. They have like, it was, I think we were working with Citibank. I'm pretty sure this was an episode of The Office. This exact <laughs> plot was Is an episode. It? I think Michael takes a second job and it's at a call center. He won't stick to the script. Well, you know what? It happened to me first and it probably <laughs> was inspired by the story. There you go. <laughs> uh, we end the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. All right. Are you ready? Sure. Uh, what childish thing do you still enjoy Ooh. Hmm. I don't know if, I don't know if childish maybe just something you did when you were a kid that you still do now I don't know I mean one thing that I did when I was a kid that I stopped doing and now I'm doing again is playing video games yeah um, it's not the most productive use of my time but it's a lot of fun I would argue that video games aren't even a childish thing anymore Maybe not. Maybe you know what not. I mean? Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, but they're like. Mm, I guess it depends who you ask. Yeah, it depends there's who you certain ask. Certain people who always put it in that category. I mean, my parents like. I think it's like a generation thing, right? Like, so because we kind of grew up with video games that were like more advanced than Pong, <laughs> like we kind of got that like, that wanting to play those kinds of games whereas like my parents would have never been able to play anything yeah so we've kind of witnessed the evolution of, of video games while we were growing up um whereas like there were very few options as, for my parents but it's just weird because like i view video games as like watching a movie you know what i mean mm -hmm. same thing you wouldn't yeah. call watching a movie childish that's uh to me yeah. it's just a way a different way to relax yeah yeah that's yeah. true but but yeah, unless, so, unless you're spending uh -huh. Unless you're spending 12 hours a day. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're screaming at eight-year-olds <laughs> through a headset. A lot of the times I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess uh, hmm, another childish thing. You get called names by eight-year-olds on the other side of the country. All Outside the time. Of the world. All the time. But uh, it's uh, – the games have gotten so good. They've gotten so good. And the one thing I can say that, like, sort of justifies the amount of time that I spend is – I've been watching a few TED Talks that talk about how gaming is actually good for cognitive function in a lot of okay. ways. So I don't feel too bad about it. But it's sparking something up there. It's sparking something, yeah. you know. And I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. The in best fact, game I'm of Jones all time. Play right now. <laughs> best video game of all time in your opinion. It's got to be PUBG, the one I'm playing right now. It's such a good game. It's like the perfect game. Okay, something that stands the test of time, though, because that's too new. Oh, okay. Well, Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike... I guess there's like different versions of it, so but it it's always the same game. It's just like the the quality gets better and the sound gets better. But like the first Counter Strike game that came out, um, like 15, 20 years ago, 
uh, was just Counter Strike. Yeah, CS, CS, and now like the newest one is called CS Go, but so it's the same game again, just yeah. better quality. So that one, and then Mario Kart. I mean, Mario Kart. Right? Any, which is your favorite? But I mean, they're all good. They're all good. But I just play more. I like first person shooters a lot. Okay. I like being in that intense. I mean, for a while when I was playing PUBG, like anytime I would peek a corner in the game, I would kind of lean like in my computer chair as well. (laughs) And when I get shot, when I got shot, I would kind of like get startled and like sort of cower a little bit. (laughs) It's really realistic. I mean, I'm listening to the background sound on like these. 5.1 5.1 surround sounds and it just feels super realistic like you're so in the game and I have this huge like 35 inch monitor that just like curves around and I mean it's, have you done virtual reality at all I have yeah that's I was one. uh who was it? Scott I was in Scott Seaver's apartment mm-hmm. he's got a big setup there for, for VR HTC Vive or Oculus Rift I have no idea okay. I have no idea I had the headset on and he told me the wall is the border and I could see like a square yeah. around me. And then all of a sudden he turns on this simulation. I'm underwater. <laughs> and I felt like I couldn't breathe. Really? And like it was creepy. And I turn around. There's like a monster there. I'm like, ah! Yeah. And the entire time I'm repeating myself, it's not real. It's not real. It's not real. And it's still my brain couldn't make the connection. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, we're still sort of like evolved from monkey brain. So, I mean, <laughs> when, you, when you see water, you assume that you're in the water. Yeah. But yeah, there's uh, there's um, there's this game called uh, Brookhaven Experiment on on HTC Vive that I was playing for a while, and basically zombies come from like every corner uh-huh. of the room, and you have to shoot them, you got to throw nades at them, you got to stab them with a knife, and that you survive so as long real. as you can. You survive as long as you can, and every so you kill a bunch of zombies off, mm-hmm. and then you play the next wave, and then after and then that wave gets it gets progressively more difficult. And eventually the zombies are just coming at you so fast and <laughs> you gotta like shoot them with two guns and it's intense and it's a yeah. workout. Like just you, like camping. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's It really is like you get the same cortisol spikes that you would get if like and a real zombie was, you know, it's the same thing, right? Like yeah. You're plugged into something that makes you feel like it's real. So. All right, guys, check it out. Those are Sorrell's video game recommendations. Absolutely. Sorrell, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That was you great. Got it. Thank you. That's the show. Thanks again to Sorrell. You can follow along with his crazy poker life on Twitter, at Sorrell Mitzi. Uh, If you liked what you heard and you haven't yet done so, go ahead and click that subscribe button to get a new Poker Stories episode every two weeks. We're on Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and pretty much wherever you can get a podcast. If you want to go the extra mile and leave a rating and review, let us know about it with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening. Attention American poker players. Do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to globalpoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for US players. That's globalpoker.com.